So we've all had that one call where everything worked out in our favor. Good guys won, bad guys zero. But later on, if you were honest, you would look back and you'd realize there were some mistakes that I made. There were some things that I could have done differently. I had a call like that one night, one winter. It was a traffic stop. I was set up on a stop sign in a neighborhood where I would wait and I'd get people blowing through that stop sign and I'd get them with the drugs and the guns and the warrants all day long. And there was this one particular car and I pull him over and I immediately know that I'm on to something big. I, I step up to the car and he's there and he's gripping the steering wheel. His muscles are so tense. And I look and his carotid is pulsing. And there's these little beads of sweat on his nose. And so I continue to ask and of course he refused search of the vehicle. So I get his documents and I go back to my patrol car and on the way I immediately call for backup and I call for a K-9 unit to come out to, to run the car. But as I'm sitting there in my patrol vehicle and I'm running his, his information, I think to myself, self, you could speed this process up a little bit. Why don't you just go ahead and get him out of the car, pat him down, everything will be set when the dog gets here. And so in my excitement, I approached the vehicle, I said, sir, step out of the car, and I put him at a position of disadvantage on his vehicle. I'd, I had his, his belt, and I began to pat him down. I noticed his muscles got more tense, and he was nervous. You could just tell, and he was trying to distract me. There, there's weed in the car. Go to the car. But I was too smart to be distracted. And so I get down to his, his right front cargo pocket, and I feel what, based on my training and experience, as it went in the report, was a significant amount of drugs. And as soon as I got there and I felt it, I said, what's this? He took off. Well, he tried to, but I was holding his belt. I forgot to mention something. This guy was big, kind of like David and Goliath big. Well, maybe not that big, but he was a college fullback playing football. And you see, I'm not that big of a guy. So that night, there we were, I'm holding his belt, and we're playing football, only it's flag football, and I'm the flag that's waving off of his belt as he runs down the street. And finally, he falls forward, and I fall backwards, and we get up, and we continue to run, and thankfully, this guy is a guy that's fashionable. And he wears his pants around his thighs, and so after about the third time of tripping over himself, I'm standing over him with my gun drawn, and the chase is over. And found a significant amount of marijuana and even larger amount of cocaine. And after I got back to his car, I found that there was a loaded gun. My backup arrived and one of the officers who was a friend and a mentor, older and wiser, he looked at me and he said, why couldn't you have just waited another minute? You know, he was right. I won that night, but things could have turned out so much more differently. I had a call like that too, a personal call one night. July 2nd of 2008, we were at home. Our baby girl was just eight days old. We had gone to bed and she began to cry. So we jump out of the bed like new Paris would. We run into the room and immediately my wife is standing there checking her pulse and says, my heart's racing. So I told her to go back into the bedroom and I followed her. And before I could get much else out, she fell back on the bed with what I now know was a massive heart attack. And she was clinically dead for over 15 minutes while I performed CPR on her, calling 911. Paramedics defibrillated her a total of nine times. She was airlifted to a local trauma hospital where the doctors told me she won't live, and if she does live, she's going to have significant brain damage. And it was there in the piercing silence of that dark ICU waiting room that I had time to think about the mistakes that I had made in my marriage, the ways that I had failed to serve her and to love her. Long story very short, for the sake of time, she survived that night miraculously. So yes, I won that night, but looking back, there were some things that I could have done much more differently. 
There's this movie, Rocky III, great American classic movie. I recommend it if you haven't seen it. And in this movie, Rocky's getting ready to fight Clubber Lang, the character played by Mr. T. But his, his trainer, Mick, is frustrated and is getting ready to walk out. And Rocky confronts Mick and he says, you know, where are you going? And, and, and Mick says, Rocky, he's going to kill you to death inside of three rounds. And Rocky says, he's just another fighter. And Mick says, he's not just another fighter. He's a human wrecking machine and he's hungry and he's going to knock you into tomorrow. You know, there are some people that look at the law enforcement profession and they say, it's just another career. Besides, it's what you signed up for. But the truth of the matter is, is I think we signed up to serve, not to be pummeled by a profession that can be literally a human wrecking machine on our mental health, on our marital and relational health, our muscle health. Kind of like the song we grew up, head and shoulders, knees and toes. And, you know, so I think about what if our agencies implemented a new sort of field training officer program? Because we say to each other, brother, sister, whatever you do, make sure that you go home at the end of the night. But what happens then? So what you make at home and you're unhealthy and you're unhappy and you're miserable? What happens if you make it home and your family is no longer there for you? Or worse yet, they're there, but they don't want you there. You see, I believe that the things that are really destroying law enforcement is not those outside dangers, not those outside influences or factors. It's the internal things. It's the things within our area of control, within our span of, of responsibility, the things that we can affect. It's what are we going to do with the opportunity that's laying at our feet to reshape this culture? So what if our agencies had someone to come alongside of us to help us navigate the challenges of this career? What if formally or informally they implemented mentoring? Well, what is mentoring? Mentoring is simply somebody who's more knowledgeable, more experience coming alongside someone who is less knowledgeable or less experienced, or perhaps somebody who is successful in their relationships coming alongside someone who is not as successful. And so we could talk about would agencies do something like this, but I don't want to talk about a particular model. You're the type of people that I know have the characteristics to be great mentors. So I want to share with you, because you may be like me, say, Jonathan, where do I begin? Sometimes I feel stretched a mile wide and an inch thin. What do I do? How do I do this? So I want to share with you three characteristics about mentors very quickly. The first is that mentors possess a certain attitude. There's a movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, and it's about this guy who has dreams of being a symphonic composer. Only life happens, and in the process of caring for his family, he has to be a high school music teacher. And at the end of his career, after all of this time, he never completed that transcendent work of music that he so desired. But what he found was his grand masterpiece was not the notes on the page, but they were the lives of the students that he had touched. Think about the greatest thing that you've ever done, the, greatest, the biggest case, the best arrest. It's probably forgotten by most people at this point. The things we leave behind, the stuff is forgotten. In fact, New York Times best-selling author Mark Batterson says this. He says, an inheritance is what we leave for someone, but a legacy is what we leave in someone. The stuff you do will be forgotten, but the lives that you impact will never be forgotten. The attitude of a mentor is one that says, I want to leave a legacy. I want to make a difference. I value people and relationships over the results and the performance. Mentors possess a certain attitude. But not only that, mentors also provide their calculated attention. I have a friend who is an elementary school teacher, and she issued a writing assignment to her students some time ago. And she read one of the stories about a student who wrote that he wanted to be a cell phone when he grew up. So curiously, she asked for more detail. 
And he said, yeah, that's right. I want to be a cell phone when I grow up. So maybe then my mom will pay attention to me too. We live in a disconnected, distracted, relationally disengaged culture. And we blame it on millennials and generation gaps, but the truth of the matter is this. Don't think for one instance that these young officers that are coming into your agencies are not starved for time and attention. They're longing for somebody that will pour into their life, that will teach them not just how to do the job, but how to do it successfully, how to to be a cop that survives life and retires well. Larry Stockstill is an author, and he said this about mentoring. He said, mentoring is spelled T-I-M-E. It's not a lesson It's not a lecture, but it's a lifestyle. It's coming alongside of others and pouring into them with your life. In fact, I think about one of my mentors, Dr. Bill George, who died recently. Dr. George had influenced hundreds, if not thousands, of lives of young men. And at his funeral, his son said this about him. He said what he taught him about mentoring and about legacy was this. He said, everybody wants to be efficient with their time. But when it comes to people, you cannot be efficient if you want to be effective. Time is how relationships are built. Time is how values are learned. Time is how character is forged. Time is how legacy is imparted. Are we willing to invest the time and the calculated attention into the lives of those around us to reshape this culture of law enforcement. Mentors don't only provide calculated attention or possess that attitude of legacy. I find there's a third thing, and that is that they perform with consistent actions. Around the turn of the century, 1999 or so, it just sounds cool to say turn of the century, I remember the movie Titanic coming out. And it's about the maiden voyage of this unsinkable cruise liner. You know the story. But yet one night traveling through the Atlantic, it runs afoul of a giant iceberg, and this unsinkable ship sank. In his book, The Secret, What Great Leaders Know and Do, Ken Blanchard talks about leadership from the perspective of the 80-20 principle, and he compares it to an iceberg. He says that 20% of who you are, the stuff that's seen above the surface, that's your skill. Think about the current way we do FTO. We focus on the stuff that's seen, the skill. And we do it for a limited period of time. But what about the 80% that's below the surface? Blanchard says that that 80% is your character. The things that we don't often focus so much time and effort and energy in instilling. And he says that nine out of ten times, if a ship is going to sink, it's not going to sink because of your skill. It's going to sink because it uh, it runs into problems with your character. And so if we understand that this is what's taking out our officers, their mental health, suicide, our marital relationships and the destruction of family and our precious children in the way, the struggles financially, our struggles missionally. If these are the things that are really taking us out, isn't it time that we do something intentionally? That we perform as leaders and mentors to focus on character, to lead with integrity, to lead with consistency that pours our lives into others so that we truly can reshape this and correct the ship and keep those ships from continuing to sink and being yet another news story. Mentors, if we were to implement mentoring, you as a mentor, you possess a certain attitude of legacy. You provide your calculated attention, a lifestyle, being transparent and open and coming alongside. You perform with consistent actions. And I'll leave you with this thought. It's a story that maybe you've heard. 
I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, along the coast, and from time to time, things would wash up, animals would wash up on the seashore. It's the story of the starfish thrower. And it's the story of a young boy who's walking along when all of these starfish have, walked onto, have washed onto the shore, and he begins to pick them up one by one and throw them back into the ocean. And as he does, an older gentleman comes along and he sees what he's doing and he questions him. You can't save them all. Why are you doing that? And the young man, he reaches down and he picks up one more and he throws it back in. I saved that one. And for that one, it made all the difference in the world. You can't change the culture of law enforcement by yourself. You can't maybe even change your agency. But for that one that you come alongside of in mental health crisis and save his or her life, for that one, you made all the difference in the world. You've been a success and you've been married 20 or 30 years. You know how to do this thing. For that one that you come alongside of and you help, for that one, for those children, you make all the difference in the world. That's what it's about. That's what leaving a legacy and imparting our lifestyle and changing the tra 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 trajectory of, of law enforcement is all about. Because in this profession, we all want, well, no, we need to know that we're making a difference. But you will never make a greater difference in anything you do than in the lives of those around you that you impact and you change for the good. It's time that we in law enforcement are intentional about mentoring one another. So I ask you this. Not only are you willing, but will you leave made up in your mind that you're going to change somebody's life and that you are going to be a part of the culture shift in law enforcement that says enough is enough. Thank you.